1956, five American men were killed by a remote Indian tribe in Ecuador. Almost 50 years later, their families journey to the Amazon rainforest to visit the tribe, the Waodani. This is probably the most violent society that that the world has ever known. I mean, just there was no chief, no elders, um, no way of um, reconciling disputes other than killing. If somebody did something that you didn't like, you ignored it. If you couldn't ignore it, you killed them. If you killed them, then the rest of them were, were obliged and it was their duty to act, come back and avenge that killing by killing somebody in your family or if they were smart, killing your whole family so there'd be nobody to go back and wreck vengeance on them again. This culture was a culture of death. Outsiders were killing Waurani. Waurani were killing Waurani at an incredible rate. Um, babies who were born too quickly after another baby, the fathers would usually kill because the mother couldn't flee with two babies. So the babies were being killed old people that the community couldn't support, you know, they were moving all the time and always scared. So old people that couldn't make a contribution to the community, they would just let them die. Um, then there were certain norms within the culture. If a father was speared and he was dying, he could ask for his children to be buried with him so he wouldn't be alone. Giving the, want that be and giving money. I am giving the, I am giving the, being the, and I am giving the, get on it. You got this whole culture that's dwindling in size and pretty soon it was difficult to find cross cousins for people to marry. So in frustration then the young men would just say, man I'm going to go get a wife. So they'd go find a family that had daughters and they would take friends with them and kill everybody in that family group except the the marriageable girls and take them. We had heard of a tribe of Indians called the Alcas, now called the Waurani. So from day one, Nate started looking for their houses. Anytime he'd be flying out, in that section, northeast section of the jungles. I think it was probably a daily prayer that if God wanted us to be part of reaching the Alcas, that the Lord would do something to make it obvious to us. My mom and dad were missionaries down here at the same time as Steve Saint's father and Jim Elliott. They all, you know, most of them, Jim and my father and Pete had all known each other in college. And uh, they were all here in the early 50s. My mom and dad were stationed in Atahuno. And Nate was the pilot for all the missionaries in the area, so there was common, you know, connection there. And they had all heard about the Alcas, that's what they called them back then, the Warani. And they were kind of, you know, it was kind of a famous story how, how dangerous a tribe they were and stuff. And Nate and Ed McCulley and two Kichwas were flying out in that general area and the Kichwa man in the back seat said, there they are, those are Alka houses, and came back home so excited to think that they knew where they lived. 
but they also knew their reputation, that anybody who came into their territory risked being speared to death. The first bucket drop was incredible. Nate and, and Ed practically flew without the plane into the house. They could just hardly stop talking about, there wasn't anybody around, but it, it happened just exactly like they wanted it to, and they dropped the gifts, and then they flew over, and then they saw people coming, a couple people coming, and uh, picking up the machete and a few of the other things. It's the very second week that they let down that basket, bucket, whatever. The second visit, the Indians held that line, took off our gift, and tied on one of their own. Ed McCulley was in the plane, and he and Nate came flying back to Ed's station on the edge of the territory. They, they didn't even bother to reel in the line. They just let it fall behind the airplane. Went racing back to see what was in the basket, and it was a live bird. They said that bird had never flown so fast in all of its life as behind the airplane. Well, that was so encouraging to us. Just excitement. There wasn't any fear. There was just excitement, and God is just working so much faster than we thought he would work. For 13 weeks they did that. We exchanged gifts with the Indians. Every single flight was exciting like that. I have a picture of Jim and Ed. And Jim is trying to feed Ed the monkey meat. And Jim ate the monkey meat, tried to get Ed to eat it. They sent us back uh, feather crowns. And they sent back combs, homemade combs that they made. Smoked fish. There was a lot of activity during that time because, of course, they were flying over the Alka houses then and making plans to, to, as to what, how they were going to reach the Alkas. Were they going to go by canoe? Um, finally, Nate found that beach that, where he could land. And then he would fly the fellows into that sandbar. Jim Elliott would make a prefabricated treehouse. Roger Udarian would be in charge of food. Everybody had this assignment. <laughs> So he flew them into the sandbar, they put up the treehouse, 
and each night three fellows would sleep in the treehouse. And then Nate and Pete Fleming, Pete was the lightest in weight of all of them, so he and Nate would fly back to the McCulley's mission station where Barbara Udarian and Mary Lou were. When I left and he was going to be flying out to um, the beach, that I said I didn't expect to see him again. And he, he just tried to assure me that, that he'd be back. But he had written in his diary that there's something fatal could happen. And that's why they had put off the two of them. He and Jim had put off marriage because of the Alcas. Bon, you money. They waited Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then on Friday, three Indians appeared, a young woman, a young man, and an older woman. They just came walking out of the jungles on the far side of the river, and the men invited them over, and they had a friendly contact that day. <laughs> When they came, you know, came home to Arahuna on Friday, they were again excited and told us about the two women and the man that showed up, and about taking, the, and about calling the man George and about how he was taken with the plane, wanted to ride in it, and how Nate took him for a ride over his own people, and he they, he thinks that's the reason he wanted to ride in the plane. He wanted his people to see him up in the plane. He waved to them. What excitement! Nate would report into me as frequently as he could uh, about this first friendly contact in known history with this tribe of Indians. We learned later that the two, the man and the young woman had left, but the older woman had stayed most of the night because her, the embers were still alive in the fire when they got up off from the treehouse. They waited all day Saturday and nobody came. Nate was reporting to me frequently on the radio from the airplane and I was making notes of all that he said. But on Sunday when they left, they were just jubilant, weren't they, Barbara? And Pete especially. Pete was a very serious, not one that was got overly excited like Jim and, and Ed did. And he called to Barbara and me a couple times, pray girls. We were girls in those days, not ladies. Pray, this has got to be the day. And it was the day. Nate had said that he was going to call me at 4.30 that afternoon and give me the good report of another friendly contact. I could hardly wait. I'm going to call at 4.30, so at 4 o'clock I started tuning the radio. There was only silence. And finally, when nightfall came, there was so much interference. I knew that I wouldn't hear him even if he did call. We went to bed knowing that there was something wasn't right because the plane didn't get back and we didn't hear any contact. Of course, we imagined maybe the radio wasn't working. Olive Fleming was with me and Elizabeth Elliott was on her station and Mary Lou and Barbara were on Mary Lou's station. And uh, so Mary Lou called in. She said, Marge, the plane didn't come back last night. And I said, Oh, that's why Nate didn't call. There's something wrong with the engine or with the radio, but he'll get that fixed in no time. Of course, I thought he was the best mechanic in the world. He'd get it all taken care of. We knew something was wrong, but we didn't know until the next morning when Johnny Keenan flew into Arahuno, took Barb with him, and flew over the beach. Nate had told him exactly where the plane, where they were flying. And then we knew that there had been trouble, and the plane was there on the beach. And the men weren't there. We were just sure the five men were making their way home through the jungles. There was never a question in my mind that this was, that God was working, 
I'm, I'm sure that for me at least I thought somebody would be alive. And we didn't know the whole world was waiting. We were out in the jungle and it was later that we found out how many people knew how the news had gotten out so quickly, how the whole world, Christian world, was praying for us. <laughs> On Sunday, all five fellows were back on the beach and they heard uh, sounds across the river and looked up and there were more of the Indians, the naked Indians. So a couple of fellows waded out into the river to meet them and, uh, well, they were just decoys. And then others came from behind them, from the side of them, and speared all five men to death, threw their bodies in the river, and fled. Uh, three of the Kichwa men wanted to go into the beach, which was miraculous because they were scared stiff uh, all their lives of the Warani, of the Akas. And uh, when they came back a couple of days later, they had Ed's watch, and they had his shoe, one of his shoes, size 13 shoe, and they told me how they had found him. And I didn't think God had left me, no. I knew that God had something in mind. And it, it, was, it wasn't until the end of the week that we knew for sure they were all gone. I think all of us would say that. We knew God, God was working. I didn't have any idea why, but I never doubted what we were doing the right thing. You know, it's just, it's just amazing the way God works. I mean, that contact could have been a friendly contact and, re and, and stayed a friendly contact, but it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't in his plan, so. And what was in his plan was, you know, a lot of changes for these people, so. I never, ever heard my mom, but when people would ask her questions about it, she would say, how how could we blame them because that's how they lived we knew that's how they lived that's just how they acted you know we thought we could we could help them change but we certainly can't go in there and have them act the way they've always acted and you know hold it against them the reason that the waurani after having a friendly contact with dad and his four friends went back and speared them was that nankiwi the george from palm beach lied to them and told them that dad and his friends had attacked them. I don't think that the people really believed that it had happened, but they needed to kill somebody because there's so much anger in the tribe between Nankiwi, the George from Palm Beach, and one of the other warriors in the tribe that they finally decided if there was going to be killing, better to go kill the foreigners than to have more killings within the tribe. <laughs> When Aunt Rachel came in and started telling the people about this new reality, about the option to follow God's trail and live according to his norm, his culture, um, there were some people that ad adopted it right away and were enthusiastic about it. Very few people actually decided to become God followers, but everybody suddenly had a, had a reason to give up their killing because Wang Ungi, the creator being, said don't kill. So everybody's kind of like, yeah, that's great. So they quit, they quit killing, pretty much. I mean, you can't say exactly what part their death had in it, but there is definitely another side of the story. I mean, these people are these people are changed people, no doubt about it. Even the ones that aren't Christians, at least they're not running around spearing each other, which has got to be a little better lifestyle than they had, you know. To me, there's three major groups that showed a lot of courage. One was the men in going in. One is the women who had the faith to be able to let their husbands go in. And the other is the Indians who, I can't imagine how much courage that took and faith it took to say, I'm gonna stop living the way I've been living, knowing that not everybody else might follow that. First time I came in to meet the Waurani is when I was 
about nine. My dad was killed when I was five. Aunt Rachel and Aunt Betty came in to live with the Waodani when I was about almost three years later. Um, and then it was about a year, year and a half later that Aunt Rachel thought it would be safe for a boy my size to come in. The Waodani didn't, didn't take real kindly to boys whose family they had killed coming into their territory. Because a little boy grows up to avenge his family's killings and um, they just treated me like family. And then not long after that, um, Minkai, who had two sons my age, I started realizing he was treating me a little bit a little bit more like a son than a, than a visitor. But it's only been recently <clears throat> that I had heard that it, it was actually chemo that had killed Pete. And, and I'm not sure, I've, I've wondered whether chemo knows that it was my husband. I guess it was kind of a relief to know which one had actually done it. And to see his life now, I mean, that's what it was all about. That's why they went. So, it's amazing. Money get the money to mama. Money be had to put the money in my mouth. You know what money come? Tell me how you know me that I'm going to put it in my mouth. Tell me how you know me. As Minkai says, only if you walk God's trail do you end up where God is. Which is a picture of their fleeing days, you know, when they, people would come to kill them. Um, the signs would be people rushing into the house, um, somebody screaming, you know, that has been speared, and then they would just flee into the jungles and the families would be separated. Um, the adults could usually figure out sort of where they were going to end up, but uh, the kids, they were separated from their parents and really it's miserable spending nights out in the cold, damp jungle with marauding animals, jaguars and anacondas and things going around. So it was miserable and they wanted to get back with their parents. Their parents couldn't go out and find, you know, three, four, five kids that were all wandering around and hiding under the roots of trees at night. So the parents would mark the trail that, as they fled, and then the kids, when they thought the coast was clear and the, you know, the attackers had left, sometimes, you know, days later, then they would start looking around the jungle around where their house had been, because usually the people would burn it. And then when they'd find their parents' marked trail, then they would start following that trail and they knew that if they followed those markings long enough, that finally they'd come to where their father was, where their parents were, and where the family was assembling. And so when Aunt Rachel came out and started teaching them from this book, this thin bark, this stuff with markings on it, they understood that this was, this was God's carvings, that God had sent his son Itota to mark his trail so that following that trail we could come and live with him and in the process you know we would understand as be reconciled to him but their picture is really much easier to understand hey God marked his trail it's a good trail it's a narrow trail so you need the markings to be able to follow it but if you follow it long enough you finally come to where God is and and you're reunited with the family